Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for Casaberry live stream worship. Just a few of us have come to the church building this morning to make a video possible today, and we appreciate this effort to be together by this means. This is the best we can do under these unusual circumstances, and we anticipate, we truly anticipate the time that we can all be together again. I do want us to have a sense of togetherness today with our knowledge that many of our members are watching and participating. In our minds and hearts, we can be together and praise and pray and study and commune this morning. It isn't ideal, but it is real as we make it uh, today. So thank you for understanding and your cooperation. And by the way, I have a little something for our children at the end of our time together today, so be sure they're watching. We will now worship with a few songs, ones that we have chosen that we think you will find easy to sing along with at home. So let's praise and glorify our awesome God. And after a couple of songs, we will bow together in prayer. Good morning. Let's sing Awesome God. Mm -hmm. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. Now we will sing, We Will Glorify the King of Kings. After this song, we'll be led in our opening prayer. Do me so me we will glorify the King of Kings, we will glorify the Lamb, we will glorify the Lord of Lords, who, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before his throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of Kings, Hallelujah to the Lamb, Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who, who is the Great I Am. Let's pray together. Our wonderful God and Father, we are thankful to come before you this morning and to praise you as the creator of all things. For we recognize, Father, that in your great power and wisdom all things have been created, and every good and precious and perfect gift comes from you, the Father of lights. And we're so thankful, Father, that you are not only all-powerful and all-knowing, but you are a gracious and merciful God that has provided for your people time and time and time again that you have worked throughout history to accomplish your purposes so that your people may know you, so that they might be preserved, so that they might accomplish your purposes in this world. And we recognize, Father, that you are a God of compassion and mercy as well. And we ask you, Father, for your compassion and mercy at this time. We pray, Father, that you would work through the events in the world at this time to draw people to you. May we all be shaken awake to the temporal nature of this world, to the problem of sin and suffering and death, so that we might look to you, Father, who has 
the solution to all of those things, for you are the great I am. You are the resurrection and the life. And that through your son Jesus, we can be forgiven of our sins and we can be given eternal life in him. And we look forward to his wonderful return. And so, Father, we pray that you would draw our hearts close to you in this worship. Comfort us, instruct us, and guide us, Father. And accept our thanks and our praise for your son Jesus and for your wonderful word that gives us your truth and wisdom. May you be honored in what we do. We thank you that you are an ever-present help in our time of need. In the name of Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. We will now begin our focus on Jesus as we participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. So to prepare our minds, let us sing, Jesus, let us come to know you. Me, Jesus, let us come to know you, let us see you, face to face, touch us, hold us, use us, mold us, only let us live. Jesus, draw us ever nearer, hold us in your loving arms, wrap us in your gentle presence, when the end comes, bring us home. Keeping with the great thoughts of this song, I will direct our attention today to the book of 1 John in the New Testament. This letter that we know as 1 John was written by John, a disciple of Jesus, an apostle, and a close friend of Jesus. Jesus tells us, John tells us that he saw and heard, and get this, he even touched Jesus. He writes what he experienced with Jesus so that we may have fellowship with God and with God's people. John explains that this includes being forgiven of our sins, keeping Jesus' commandments, and walking as Jesus walked. So as we take the Lord's Supper this morning, let John's experience of Jesus be our means of fellowship and forgiveness, our motivation to obey Jesus and to walk with him. 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And now if you will take the bread in whatever form you have it, and 
be prepared to take it, I will lead us in prayer regarding this bread. Our dear Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, and for the sacrifice that he made for us, that we might be your people now and forever. We're sorry that he had to suffer and die, but we're so appreciative that he did because this is an atonement for our sins. And we thank you for this bread that reminds us of the life and body of Jesus and what he did for us so that we might be yours. Be with us, Father, as we partake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. continue in prayer for the fruit of the vine. Our Almighty Father in heaven, we thank you so much again for the sacrifice of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. We thank you now for this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood which he shed on that cross. We pray that as we partake together this morning, that we will do so in a well-pleasing manner, keeping in remembrance the pain and agony that our Savior went through and endured for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. That concludes our taking of the Lord's Supper this morning. Such a wonderful privilege we have to do that together as much as we can on this occasion. It's not possible for to collect our contribution as we usually do, but several means have been provided for us to do that, and they have been set in place. You may give electronically by the means you see here through PayPal, Venmo, or Zelle. For those electronic payment systems, you may use the email address contribution at com, Or, of all things, you may send it in the regular mail to 1025 Merrick Street, Fort Worth, Texas, 76114. Or even, you can stop by the building and put it in the mail slot that's in the front of the building by the doors to the right as you face the building from Merritt Street. We typically say this, and I want to say it here, that this is an opportunity and responsibility of our members, and it's not a solicitation from others. Now, we'll go to a song before our sermon today. Glorify Thy Name is the song. Following that, Tim Jennings will preach to us from God's mighty word. Let's sing together. Glorify Thy Name. No me so me Father we love you we worship and adore you glorify thy name in all the earth glorify thy name Glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Jesus, we love 
to be worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. We love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. <clears throat> well, good morning. I am glad that you've been able to join us this morning for this time of worship online. And I'd invite you to take a Bible at home and open with us to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And I will say that we're happy to announce this morning that there is a new technology that we're using that allows us to see you at home just as clearly as you see us. That's not true. But I imagine that may, made a few of you a little bit squirmish. But uh, I'm glad that you're able to worship with us. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is this idea that things are not always as they seem. And this is a truth that we often confront because of our own limitations of knowledge and wisdom and power. The way things seem to be is not the way that they are actually. And that is a major biblical theme, in fact, that things are not always as they seem. Way back in Adam and Eve's day, when they sin, there seems to be these unchangeable consequences Adam and Eve begin to sweat and suffer and die. They're thrust from the presence of God and things look quite dismal. Things are not as they seem. God plants a seed of hope that there would come one who would destroy the power of sin and suffering and death. As you go on in the Bible story, you come across Abraham who is a homeless, childless man and yet Things are not as they seem. He is the father of nations. He is the one who has a city whose builder and maker is God. And as you go on, you see that Jesse had his youngest son, the one no one accounted for. No one would have imagined that he would have been king, but things are not as they seem. For God says to Samuel, Look at David, for I do not look as man looks upon things. Man looks upon the outward appearance, but I see the heart. Things are not as they seem. And when you get to the New Testament, you have a young, poor virgin who God chooses to give the right to be the one to bring his Christ into the world. Everyone thinks that she's been unfaithful to her betrothed, but things are not as they seem. God works amazing, great things through her. Things are not as they seem. This is such a major biblical theme that is sometimes called the great reversal. Because while we cannot see things the way they really are because of our own limitations, God is not so limited. His knowledge is the knowledge of the Alpha and the Omega, the one who knows the beginning from the end. He is the one who is all-powerful and all-wise, and while things may not be clearly seen by us, they are truly clearly seen by Him. But when it comes to this idea that things are not as they seem, there is no clearer example of that than what happened at the cross. 
For at the cross, it seems like a dark and dismal day. It seems like the greatest tragedy of humanity. But things are not as they seem on that day. For God is working out a more glorious purpose than has ever been worked out in the history of humanity. At the cross, things are not as they seem. And we will see that this morning in Matthew chapter 27. After three years of public teaching and preaching and healing and mercy, the religious and political authorities have come to resent the popularity that Jesus has, and so they have determined to execute him, to murder him. And under the secrecy of night, they hold six conflicting trials, and they condemn him to death. And Jesus will spend no time on death row. They rush him to execution. And it begins with this step in Matthew 27, in verse 27. Matthew 27, in verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium, and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. And they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns, and they set it upon his head. And they put a staff in his right hand, and they knelt in front of him, and they mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. And they spit on him, and they took the staff, and they struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took him off, took off the robe. And they put his own clothes on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. Jesus had already been beaten twice this night. This is the third time. But this beating is made more terrible by the fact that it is associated with ridicule. They strip Jesus and they dress him up as a king, though grotesquely like. They put upon his bloody back a robe. They put in his hand a stick like it is his scepter. They twist a crown of thorns and they push it upon his head. And then they begin to mock him. Hail king! Hail king! Because they don't believe it at all. But this ridicule continues. It is the Romans who put upon the cross of Jesus... Jesus, King of the Jews, and they don't believe it. A king on a cross? No way. And then underneath the cross, there are those Jewish religious leaders who are walking about and saying, He said he was a king. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe upon him. You see, everybody around the cross is calling Jesus king, but nobody believes it. And yet, the readers of this gospel, who have seen Jesus speak, and they have seen the miracles he has performed, have come to understand that he is a king. In fact, the very first words in Matthew's gospel is that Jesus is of the line of David, because he is going to come fulfill the promise of God to David of an eternal kingdom. It is Matthew that tells us that it is the wise men who come from the east to say, where is this one who will become king of the Jews? It is Matthew that tells us that Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And he said, it is as you say. And yet in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is king, but more than king of the Jews. He is king of the Jews of every human who's ever lived. Because at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the resurrected Lord is going to say to us, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go make disciples and command them to obey all that I have spoken. Jesus was ridiculed as king, but he was a king. And so the question I have for us is, why does Jesus not look like a king on the cross? If he is a king, why does he look like a king? It is because we have a wrong view of what his kingdom is. 
We think that Jesus came to establish a kingdom a lot like the kingdoms of this world. A kingdom that would be personified by pleasure, power, popularity. That Jesus' kingdom is going to have the thronging crowds. It is going to have the glitz and the glory of human authority. And yet, his kingdom doesn't come like that. It is his cross that characterizes his throne. His kingdom is about dying to self and serving the spiritual needs of others. And when we understand his kingdom, we know he is king. And so we are not discouraged when the people of God seem to be so few because our king died in isolation on the cross. And we are not deceived by the religious and political kingdoms of this world that value power and glitz and glory because our king triumphed over all of those things by the power of his sacrificial love. And we are not deceived by the wealth and the glamour and the gold of this world because our king shed the most precious gift that has ever been given when he shed that blood upon the cross. Yes, people looked at Jesus at the cross and they mocked him as king, but he was a king. And people of this world may look at the people of God and they may say to us, <laughs> yeah, you are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. You are related to the king. And we are regardless of how we might look from the world. The world mocked Jesus as king, but he was. And the world may mock us as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, <laughs> but we are. Things are not always as they seem. And yet the story continues. Verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. And they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. And when, he had, and when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And they sat down, and they kept watch over him there. And above his head, they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. The way that Matthew records the cross is by emphasizing his powerlessness. Jesus seems to be powerless almost at every turn. He emphasizes the lack of physical power, that Jesus wasn't able to carry his cross member to the place of execution. You see, it was the tradition that the person who was condemned to death was to carry the impl implementation of their crucifixion to the place of execution as a way of further humiliating them. And yet the beatings of the night before seem to have been so severe that Jesus is not able to even carry the cross. And Simon must be compelled. He is physically powerless. And then when they get him to the cross, they strip him of his clothes, and he is naked. You crucified a man naked. Because the cross was not just about suffering, it was also about shame. And then those under the cross, they began to wag their heads, and then disgust, they say, You who say you can destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. You see, they are referring to an accusation they had made against Jesus earlier that night. That Jesus had said that he, would go, he was going to be able to destroy the temple and build it again in three days. And that was a preposterous idea. 
I mean, here in our area, we had a little small building that they used all kinds of explosions to try to bring down, and it didn't do it, and they had to use a wrecking ball to try to bring it down. It took weeks for it to happen. And that was just to bring a building down. But in their day, in order to bring a building down and to build another one up was the job of a lifetime. And yet, Jesus says... I will tear down the temple, and in three days, I'll build it again. And these people under the cross are looking at him and saying, Okay, you think you can build a temple in three days? Let's just see if you can save yourself from the cross. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I didn't think so. You're powerless. At least that's what they thought. You see, the the people are referring to a promise that Jesus made at the beginning of his ministry. Back in John chapter 2, Jesus had gone to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, he had said to the people in John chapter 2 and verse 19, they are asking him for a sign that you are the Christ. And he says, I'll give you a sign. Verse 19 of John chapter 2. Destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. And the Jews replied, verse 20, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and are you going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. You see, Jesus in three days is going to do a more powerful work than all of the great building projects throughout history put together. He is going to raise up his body from death. He is going to conquer the consequences of sin and death, never to die again. Jesus seemed powerless on the cross, but he was the most powerful one who has ever lived. For he is the God of creation and the God of resurrection who has conquered sin and death like no one else could. Oh, they mocked him as powerless. But he was powerful. And he shows us that true power comes from submitting yourself to the will of God. You see, the people there at the cross that day thought that real power was seen in muscle in mind, in might. But Jesus revealed that real power comes from submitting yourself to the will of God. For when we are acting upon our own might and our own mind, we are limited to our own abilities. But when we submit ourselves to doing the will of God, He works more powerfully than any human can ever work. You'll remember on one occasion that... Peter replied to Jesus saying, when Jesus asked, who am I? And Jesus said, well, you, Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And for Peter, he thought that meant popularity and power and strength. And Jesus goes on to say, do you know what that means? Being the Christ, the son of God means that I'm going to Jerusalem where I'm going to suffer and die and be crucified. And then he turns to his disciples and he says these words. He says, anyone who would come after me must also take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would want to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will find it. Jesus is saying real life, real power comes from submitting your life to the purposes and the will of God. Oh, how we need to remember this. Our life does not come from our health. It does not come from our comfort. Our life comes from the fact that we have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and he has given us resurrection life. We are powerful. Our strength does not come from our popularity, but from the fact that we are a possession from God, a possession of God. Our real power comes from acknowledging our own sinful weakness and submitting ourselves in humble obedience 
to the will of the Lord. He seemed to be powerless, but he was the most powerful one. Things are not as they seem. And the story continues. Verse 41. In the same way, the chief priest and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said. But he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. The terrible irony here is that these people had seen Jesus do great miracles. They had seen him heal the sick. They had seen him raise the dead. They had seen Jesus save others. And yet they mock him now. They ridicule him as one who is unable to save himself. And of course, this is because they see saving as only from a physical standpoint. That what we need saving from is our physical fears and our physical insecurities. But beginning at the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, we are told we have a greater need to be saved from. The angel came to Joseph and said, You shall name Mary's son Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The night before Jesus was crucified on the cross, he ate the Passover meal with his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my bread. Drink, this is my blood, which is given as a new covenant for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of many. You see, Matthew teaches us that we have a greater problem in this world than suffering and sickness and death. And our greatest problem, what we really need saving from, is sin. As we sometimes see, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. My, his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I wonder what would have happened if Jesus yielded to their ridicule and he showed, I can come down from this cross and he came down and he healed his beaten and bloodied body and he clothed himself with glory like on the Mount of Transfiguration and he said, here I am. Would they have believed that he was the Son of God? Maybe. But from that very moment, Every human being who has ever lived would be eternally out of fellowship with their Creator, lost in an eternity of hell. Yes, when they said, He saved others, but Himself He cannot save, they didn't realize how true they were. That for Jesus to save us, He could not save Himself. And the way for us, my friends, to honor that death is to be saved from sins ourselves. That our greatest need is not health, is not financial security, is not the temporary life of this world. Our greatest need is to be delivered from sin. Our greatest problem, our greatest tragedy in this world, our greatest personal tragedy is our own sinfulness. And our greatest friend is God's grace. Our greatest need is Jesus' death upon the cross. And so he saved. He was not saved, that's true. And yet he could save others. Things are not always as they seem. And yet the story be continues. Verse 43. They say, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all of the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he is calling for Elijah. 
And immediately one of them ran and he got a sponge and he filled it with wine, vinegar, and he put it on a staff and he offered it for Jesus to drink. And the rest said, no, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You see, it says there that the crowd is saying, he trusts in God. Let's all stand back and see, is God going to deliver him? Because they had this idea that if you trusted in God, God wouldn't allow you to go through things like a cross. If you really trusted in God, you wouldn't suffer or die. They believe that Jesus doesn't really trust in God. And in fact, their point seems to be validated by Jesus' words upon the cross. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, these words are carefully chosen. Nowadays, when we are speaking to one another, we'll shout out a reference. Please turn with me to Psalm 22, and everybody knows where to go. In those days, the way that you directed somebody to a Bible passage was by quoting its first verse. And here is what Jesus is doing. This, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is a direct quote from Psalm 22 and verse 1. And everybody in the audience knew that. And they knew that Jesus was directing their attention to an experience that, G that David had with his enemies. Where his enemies were against him and made him feel isolated and alone, even from his God. And David's experience was true for David, but it also looked forward to how Jesus would feel upon the cross. And the fact that Psalm 22 is about the cross is so clear because a thousand years before the implement of crucifixion ever came upon the scene, you read in Psalm 22, they have pierced my hands and my feet. It is Psalm 22 that says that the enemies are saying, quote, he trusts in God, let him deliver him. It is Psalm 22 that says, they will take my garments and they will cast lots to see who gets them. This quote from Psalm 22 is directing people to understand this was in the purposes of God. And imagine their shock when they understand that the very words they're speaking were written down by the Holy Spirit a thousand years before. And yet, there is this wonderful truth at the end of Psalm 22. It says in Psalm 22 and verse 24, listen. He has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. <laughs> you see, they thought that Jesus was abandoned, but he was not. They thought that he didn't trust in God, and so God was throwing him out to the dust because he was not pleased with him. But what God did is that he accepted his suffering, and he accepted his atonement, and he restored that fellowship. He did not abandon him. He saw the anguish of his soul, and he was pleased, and he acknowledged him and received him, and ultimately restored him. And here's the good news. At that very moment, the curtain of the temple split in two. As Jesus was piloting away from heaven into the very presence of God, taking with him many sons and daughters who would believe in him, so that we don't ever have to say what Jesus said. Elizabeth Baird Browning put it like this. Yea, once Emmanuel's orphaned cry, this universe hath shaken. It went up single, echoless. My God, I am forsaken. It went up from the holy lips amidst the lost creation. That of the lost, no son should use those words of desolation. Her point is that 
Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you and I don't ever have to say that. Even though we were the ones who have sinned. We were the ones who have gone astray. While there are times in our lives that we, like David, feel like, where is God in all of this? It is because of what Jesus has done upon the cross that no believer in Jesus, no disciple of the Lord, ever has to say, God is not with me. For he is our ever-present help in time of need. You see how the cross shows us that things are not always as they seem? Things are not always as they seem. And so, brothers and sisters, that means that we can rejoice by faith. Yes, sometimes things look dark and dreary. But by faith we can rejoice that things are not always as they seem. In our world, we are given the idea that popularity and pleasure, success and wealth and health are the purpose of life. They are life's goal. But the cross forever teaches us that things are not as they seem. That even when those things are not present, we can submit ourselves to the will of God and we can obey His will and we can love His people and we can shine our lights and in so doing, we are living life to its fullest. We are truly able to rejoice. <laughs> Paul, while talking about the own stripes that he had on his back because of preaching the, Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, he would say, you know what? I don't boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. <laughs> because it is the cross that gives us more precious gifts even when our backs are laid open with stripes that allow us to rejoice and have hope and have confidence. But not only that, when we realize that things are not as they seem, we can live with trust. We can live with confidence that when the days are difficult, we can have trust that God is going to accomplish His purposes to His glory and to the good of His people. You see, at the cross, this great reversal takes place. The powerless becomes powerful. The, the one that seems to not be able to save can save. This great reversal takes place and it does not happen because of some army arriving on the scene or some speech of a theologian. It doesn't, things don't change because of a stimulus package that's passed by a government. Things change because Jesus submitted himself to the will of God and he trusted in him who does righteously and he delivered his soul. And it is with that same trust that we live today. We live the joy of knowing that our life is purposeful. And we live in the trust that while things may look dismal and dark and difficult and fearful, things are not as they seem. Praise God that things are not as they seem. And that's only because we serve an all-wise, all-powerful, all-gracious God. Let's praise Him at this time. Noah, come and lead us in our song. Let's praise God for what He did upon the cross. Near the cross. Oh, me, Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all the healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain, near the cross a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star sheds its beam around me. Near the cross I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, 
Till I reach the golden strand Just beyond the river In the cross, in the cross Be my glory ever Till my raptured soul shall find Rest beyond the river Thank you so much for being with us today. The Cassavary Family Matters will be coming to you in an email that has been sent to the email addresses of all our members. It will be sent this afternoon. Three preachers, Tim, Coulter, and I will have our new every morning devotionals at 9 a.m. each day this coming week on the Facebook page, Cassavary Church of Christ. There will be some lessons presented on Wednesday. I'm planning to present a lesson on Revelation and Coulter will be presenting some material for children and on Chronicles, so be watching for instructions about those. There will be other classes and studies that will be available soon. You can check Cassavary Family Matters for text messages and emails and find uh, information about these things. So before we close today, I want to provide something for our children. So I'll ask our children to give your attention now. I have a few Bible drill questions, so here's the way it will work. I'll, answer the, I'll ask the questions, you give the answers to your parents, then we'll look at the answers to see if you're right. And maybe you can see if your parents know the answers to these questions. Okay, question number one. On which day of creation did God create animals and people? And the answer is, on the sixth day of creation, he did that. Next, who walked with God and did not die? Your answer is Enoch walked with God and did not die. Next, where did people try to build a tower to reach into heaven? It was at Babel, that's right. Now, this is an important one, especially. What were God's three big promises to Abraham? He promised a land, a nation, and a great blessing or seed. Who was Jesus, who we've been thinking about and praising today. Next, who pitched his tent towards Sodom? A bad mistake made by Lot. That's right. A related question, what did Lot's wife become when she looked back? Well, she didn't become beautiful. She became a pillar of salt. And now everybody always wants a harder one, so here's the harder one. Name the wisdom books of the Old Testament. I'll give you a moment to do that. The wisdom books of the Old Testament. They are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Those are our wisdom books in the Old Testament. So that's our Bible drill questions for today. Thank you for being with us. We'll have a final prayer that's going to be led by Lauren Green. Then we'll close our time this morning with a song. We'll send out that Castleberry Family Matters information in an email later on today. So since we're separated and somewhat isolated, let's sing a song that will remind us of the tie that binds us together. So we'll have our prayer, and then we'll sing Blessed Be the Tie. Let's all have a great rest of the day. Lauren? Let us bow. Our Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne of grace, we know that things are not what they seem to be. We know that you are our God and our Father and the author of our salvation. We put our faith and trust in you. We're so thankful to you for Jesus and what he accomplished on this earth. We know that he died for us, shed his blood for us, and gave us an opportunity to answer the call when given that call to come to you so that we might be your people, the people of your pasture. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for this and that we give you continually honor and praise and glory. We thank you for this good church that meets here at Castleberry. Although we're far from each other at this time, we pray for each one of us of our health, our faith, 
And we pray that we grow stronger in Thee and that we put our trust and faith into You until that final day. Heavenly Father, as we end this today, we pray that You be with each and every one of us. And we pray that You continually help us focus our mind upon You during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's close our service this morning with the singing of Blessed Be the Tie. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our hearts and prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one. Our comforts and dark cares, we share our mutual woes. Our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. That concludes our service.